This is Coda Radio, episode 131, for December 8th, 2014. And welcome to Coda Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. My name is Chris, and joining us every week is our excellent host, established on the East Coast, Mr. Michael Dominic. Hey there, Michael. Hang on, Chris. I'm getting my cross card fixed. Cross card? <laughs> Is that like a crossbow? Is it a weapon? It, it, it's or like is a, it like a jockstrap? I was going to say it's a handguard for a lightsaber, but no, it's a jockstrap. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, so uh, now, Mr. Dominic, uh, right before we started the show, you're like, okay, Chris, I have to confess something to you. Yes. So I saw that you did a last with uh, uh, Leonard Pottering, but I have not had time to listen to it. All right, that's that's a fine. That's fine. I can't well, hold it against you. I'm, I'm sure there was lots of troll material in there, though. <laughs> and, and having missed that, I you know, I just I just feel bad. I have a confession to make. What's that? I I, uh, I I think yesterday I was like in denial. Oh, I'm not getting I'm not getting a chest cold. I'm not getting sick, because you know uh, a chest cold it's not really a big deal, unless you do a lot of talking, mm. and then. Then it's a big deal. So now, uh, I, today I've come to the realization that, yes, I do indeed have a chest cold. So if you hear uh, the sound of somebody sucking on a lozenge, that's me. A lozenge? That's me. Uh, of course, it's, it's going to be a lozenge, right? You, yeah. I got yeah. these. Uh, they're, uh, they're honey lemon with echinacea. Huh? Isn't that nice? Ricola. Not, that's, they can have that. That's free. That's a free plug. So anyways, Mr. Dominic. Hey, oh, you know, we have to talk about a few things. We got a lot of feed. Did you notice how much freaking feedback we got from last week's episode? Was that crazy? I know, because I didn't yell at you enough. That was literally the feedback. I should have yelled at you more. <laughs> so uh, let I, me start was, right now. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, see, I wasn't. That wasn't the impression that I got. That's funny that you you got that. You took that away, huh? That's not what I got. That's not what I got. Uh, what? It's funny. I collected some emails here, and that's not that's not what that's not what came up. But uh, Go ahead. what did you get? What did you get? Well, I got to start. I got to mention something. Uh, otherwise, I think Rikai uh, might uh, uh, poison my salad. Uh, I hope it does. Yeah. Well, no. No, you don't. No, you yes, come on. It, yes, I, I really do, though. Wow. Wow. All right. Look, so uh, here's what we were thinking. We need your best of submissions for Coda Radio real bad, everybody. Uh, so we have a whole bunch for the Linux Action Show because I talked about this on last and then linked it in the Linux Action Show subreddit. Made it sticky. So we got a whole bunch for last. That's good. But we don't have much for Coda Radio yet or TechSnap or Linux Unplugged. Here's the thing. One of the things you may have noticed about uh, Coda Radio and other shows like it on the Jupiter Broadcasting Network, we don't miss a week. Pretty much once we start going, we never stop going. And we thought we can't do a lot for the hosts over the holiday, but maybe the best thing we could do is give them the holiday week off but actually still be able to release new content. So we have this best of form that we're asking for you to go over there and put in an episode title, a link to the episode, and about the time code where it happened, and the thing about that moment that you liked. And we're either going to do some segments of Coda Radio or clips from it. It probably won't be a clip, 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 clip thing. It'll probably be these moments together, you know, those kinds of stuff. Something that you might be able to give to someone and say, oh, hey, you should check out this Coda Radio show. Go check out this episode. It was sort of like a highlights of 2014. And it, so it could be kind of like, it could be good for like spreading the word too. So we'll have that linked at the top you of the show notes. You socialist scumbag. I know, we, we're crowdsourcing, right? Time off during, no, 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 no. Time off during the holidays. Ah, oh, humbug, I know. You know what, FTT people listening to this, turn off your show right now. Mute the speakers. You didn't hear that. <laughs> You know what Santa's bringing everybody for Christmas? Working twice as hard. What kind of socialist crap is this? Hey, man, I got a chest cold, and I still show up to do a show, and then I'm trying to give you a week off. Man, Santa works. Think about this. He pulls an all-nighter. He starts in Australia because, obviously. Right. And then he goes all the way around the world. Because of the toilets, right? Yes. Yeah. That's exactly why. Yeah. This is disgusting. This is absolutely... Well, I didn't want to get into it on air, but see, I got a text message from your wife, and she said, if you don't give him time off around the holidays, 
I'm going to break his next laptop. And I was trying well, to... That's not true, because I got a text message from my wife. I got you a present. I want a divorce. Like... <laughs> Okay, you gotta. All right, maybe. See, I was that, trying. That, to, that's all she wanted for Christmas. It was weird. <laughs> I was she just trying to save the. I was trying to give you a little time to save the marriage. You see, I was trying to help you out, but I didn't want to get into it because I know you know it's sensitive. You blue dog Democrat, you <laughs> scumbag. Wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Time right. off. To, no, no, no. That, you should work what sixteen hours on Sunday and ten hours every other day. Well, if it makes you feel better, I was going to use the time off to uh, work through some hardware issues and replace and upgrade some hardware in the studio. So I was actually unlikely. Oh, you're going to go shopping and play with new toys? No, 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 I already, I already have it. Ditches for people. You should be digging like French drains in people's basement. I was going to do some upgrades to make the shows better. Uh huh. Yeah. I mean, I was going to be working. I just wanted to give you some time off. Uh, 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 Okay, okay, Lennon. Let's just keep moving. (laughs) Okay. All right. Fine. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, is my chest cold? It seems to be getting aggravated right now. Uh, all right, so our first comment came in from the subreddit from Indie Tech Trekkie. Wow, this guy's in my ballpark right now. He's, He's in like my zone. Best friend. Yeah, he and I. I think he and I should uh, exchange uh, OK Cupid profiles, and then we should uh, date. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I always thought you were more of a Tinder man myself. <laughs> Grinder, even I, I thought that was. Uh-huh. I, I don't know. I actually is now okay. Is Grinder and Tinder? From the same company, but one's just for boys? Is that... I don't know. You know, I actually used to could do contracting for the company that owns Tinder. Um, no, they are not the same people. Okay. All right. But good. they are literally the same product, right? So Grindr is just for boys. Okay. I think it might be for girls and boys. No, it's... No, it's... I think it's only guys. I think you're right about that. So obviously that's the one for you. Yeah. Now, and how come somebody book. hasn't connected Tinder or Grindr to Uber and done like Uber Grindr or something like that? Because that sounds like a recipe for disaster. That seems like a one-stop shop, my friend. And if you no, get it, no, maybe yeah, take advantage be... of Apple Pay, so that way all parties are just no, taken care. What Airbnb plus Tinder? That's <laughs> one you want. You rent the place. It's true. That's good. I like that. Yeah, you want it. Cla- you want a classy vibe for it too. iTunes is gonna love this episode. So, yeah. anyways, Indie Track Techie, uh, he says uh, regarding the entitlement amongst recent grads, something you've touched on a few times. Uh, he says. Uh, To some degree, there's an attitude of entitlement and expectation, but in their defense, this is a problem that is created by corporate America. Companies today expect you to invest in yourself, i.e. college, and to do so is an expensive proposition, $100,000 on average, with 6% interest. No. Uh, No problem. He says this should result in higher pay because the company, after all, is sort of requiring that you go through these processes. The problem is the greed is crept in the system, so companies prefer not to make an investment in you and pay you less. Well, the market will take care of this and has, hence the need for H-1B visas. What's the solution? Businesses could help themselves by letting up on initial on initial investment. In other words, instead of requiring college degrees, allow a period of training built into the hiring process and they can pay less during this period. Believe me, it's cheaper in the long run. Else I foresee a protectionist system developing in the U.S. where tax could be placed on H-1B1 workers to make them less competitive and desirable. Good, good. Oh, look at you, Mr. Loving Taxes. Raise the taxes. Oh, who's raised the taxes now? <laughs> I know. I, you know, recently I've had a very democratic sweet streak swing through. Um, so there's a couple of reasons why that plan won't work. Not the raise the taxes. That's a great idea. The, the temporary kind of thing. You, as an employer, if you have high turnover, that might raise your unemployment insurance. So let's say you give people too many shots and you hire them as like employees, right? And you have to fire them. That's bad for you. The other thing is, why would you do that? Right? Why would you, even if you did, let's say, two months at a lower rate, Mm -hmm. if you were so unsure about them, wouldn't that just be two months of that money, their time, your time, people on the team's time wasted if it didn't work out? I suppose, but I think if you bring in somebody that has, you know, if you can recognize potential in a candidate, see that they have a capacity to learn and to adapt, then why not? So <clears throat> I go back. So we got a few emails from folks that said, yeah, I got my start early. Uh, one guy in particular, he got his start at his dad's shop because his dad owned the shop. So he just started working there. And uh, he just sort of worked up through the system and got years in IT experience. And now he has a pretty healthy resume. Somebody coming out of school doesn't necessarily have that advantage. But the reason they're going the school route is because the businesses are requiring that to get in the door. But if they remove that requirement and start with somebody earlier in the process, 
and are, are willing to work with a good candidate that has good potential, which a good hiring ma- manager, a good hiring person can generally tell if a candidate seems to be a good fit for the position. In fact, one of the things that's hardest to do when you're hiring somebody is to really get a good grasp of what their technical capabilities are. Because they can talk up a good game, they can pad up a resume, but a lot of times you can get an idea if somebody's perceptive, if somebody's a good problem solver in the conversation of the hiring process. So that's sometimes almost an easier thing to be able to hire for to begin with. So you get somebody who's passionate, interested in the topic, fits the requirements, you can pay them less since they don't have the burden of having to go to school and raise uh, you know, all of the cost of that. And then you just hire, you give them raises over the years. Right, but, but how is that different than saying, you know what, we're willing to hire associate degree people, right? You still have to vet them. I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding his point. I, I don't see the reason of doing a super, like, we've tried the trial period thing ourselves, and it's, you know, it, sometimes it feels like in most cases when you did the trial, you probably should have just not really hired the person. Hmm. And it's a little awkward, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, I mean, I'm I'm all for hiring associate degree people. I'm all for, you know, hell, a kid out of high school who's talented and just wants to do school part time. That that makes sense. But I don't know. It, I, I would say hiring and firing is horrible from both sides, right? Um, and it's it's funny though because after we did the last few shows, we got a lot of unsolicited re- resumes uh, from Coda Radio folks. Thank you. We definitely keep them on file, so don't think you're shooting into a void. Uh, currently not hiring. The issue I see is that colleges are encouraging people to perhaps be a little optimistic on their resume. Hmm. <laughs> like most resumes come in, they know Java, C Sharp, C++, Objective C, PHP, and one other scripting language. Yeah, That's so unlikely, coming right out of a two-year yeah. or four-year school, that it, it, it definitely puts you at a huge disadvantage because... And actually, one person wrote in privately, privately about this. I gave him the same thing because one of one of my pet peeves is if somebody comes to me out of a school with a resume that says C plus plus, first thing I want to talk about is you know malloc, dialloc, memory management, just to see like what percentage of your resume is actually padded. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I die. So. That's all I got. I mean, it's yeah, a I guess I do. I do. I I do concede the vetting thing. That is that is a difficult question to answer. Well, it's hard because right, the university or the school's incentive is to make you feel that you've made a good investment, right? Yeah. yeah. So obviously, when you go to their career services department, and I've had kids tell me this is exactly what happens. They are like, oh, you took a class intro to C plus plus. Oh, you did a week of Java in this. It's actually usually the opposite, right? You took intro to Java, then you did a week of C plus plus at the end of the class or something like that. Put it on your resume. It's like, yeah, but you did Microsoft C++ with a garbage collector, and you wrote, like, one thing yeah. that you copied out of a book. It's not really a big deal. <laughs> yeah, it, it's not something you want to be selling yourself on. Yeah. Um, All right. I don't know. Yeah. Well, let's shift gears. There is one particular topic that I tried to kind of limit it to just a couple of things, because this is one that we've gotten a ton of really good feedback. So I'm going to tell you, uh, we, we are collecting all of it. And uh, I have some ideas and plans that uh, Angela and I are going to work on. I'll tell you more about that in a second. But first, let's start at the top. Something that we've got a lot of recommendations in for but haven't really had a chance to mention on the show when I've been talking about converting the Jupiter Broadcasting website to a static site, something probably powered by like markdown files on the back end and something renders it up, so maybe like Pico CMS or, or something like Ghost. That's what Funny Games wrote. And we've heard a few people writing about Ghost. But we haven't mentioned it on the show, and I was checking it out this weekend, and I was pretty impressed. So I wanted to read this uh, note from Funny Games. He says, I heard on a couple of shows that Chris is looking for the static site generator. Uh, fear not, Chris, or maybe do fear a little, but Ghost is what you are looking for. Ghost is a very elegant and completely open source up on GitHub blogging platform. They also offer hosted solutions on their official site, similar to how WordPress does it. I took on the challenge to see how long it would take me to run this bad boy on my DigitalOcean server, and it literally took about 10 minutes from sign-up. DigitalOcean makes this app a one-click install, but there's also a guide here, which you'll have linked. Furthermore, you can migrate all of your WordPress content easily following a step-by-step guide that he links here. That's awesome. Ghost is a new blogging platform from the Node.js community, and already has a huge number of themes and plugins to make life easy. He says the, uh, the too-long-did-not-read version is... 
Ghost is new hotness for Markdown blogging, and it gives us as easy as one, two, three, including a guide on DigitalOcean right there. So I checked it out. There's even DigitalOcean as you can deploy a droplet with Ghost preloaded. So Ghost, it is really cool, and there are a lot of really good themes. So I wanted to give it a mention because we've had a few people write in about it. But Funny James really knocked it out of the park with all of those great links, too. So if it's something you want to look into. Uh, he also includes the third link is some free themes that are really sharp, really clean-looking themes. Uh, I'm... I'm trying to come up with a good reason to just do one for myself because this I just like Ghost so much. Uh, so anyways, thank you, uh, Funny Games, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. Speaking of DigitalOcean, why don't I mention our first sponsor this week, and that is the great folks over at DigitalOcean.com. Head over to DigitalOcean. You can be just like Funny Games or like myself. I've got three droplets. But what is DigitalOcean? You're not familiar? Friends, let me tell you. I love it. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server that you have root access to. You can get started in less than a minute, and pricing plans start only $5 per month. That'll get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. They're gorgeous. You can find pictures on their Instagram feed up on their Google Plus page. Woo, they're nice. But I'll tell you what's really nice. It's that interface to manage your DigitalOcean droplets. It is super intuitive. The control panel is really straightforward. It's crazy easy to spin up a droplet, to transfer things around, back them up, DNS management, one-click application deployment, fund your account, all of that through DigitalOcean's awesome interface. But if you're a power user, DigitalOcean can hook you up with their straightforward API. There's already a bunch of great community tools around that API, too. So you can take advantage of tools that already exist. Speaking of things that already exist, DigitalOcean really has first-class tutorials. They've already got a whole bunch on their website, but they're looking for even more. And it's an, an area that DigitalOcean is pretty passionate about, something they really want to invest in. So they're willing to pay up to $200 per tutorial. So if you've got something you want to write up, they have editors that will work with you. And they might pay you for it, too. So go over to DigitalOcean. In fact, if you want to do that, if you want to write up the tutorial, if you heard me mention it and you think, you know, I'm going to do it. Holidays are here. I could use some extra spending money. We have a link in the show notes. So go over to DigitalOcean.com and use our new December promo code, CODERDECEMBER, when you check out. That'll give you a $10 credit. You can try out that $5 rig for two months for absolutely free. DigitalOcean.com. And go use CODERDECEMBER to get that $10 credit. Why not try out Ghost with one-click install? You can get up and going in no time. And then use Funny Games' as links to really have something sweet set up. They have some great ones for, like, just photo display blogging, all kinds of stuff. That's one of the many things you could do with DigitalOcean. GitHub, I have own cloud up there, BitTorrent Sync, DigitalOcean.com, Coder December, when you check out or apply it to your account. Okay, Mike, we're going to move right along. And this is the sort of the last uh, topic for today, unless, I don't know, maybe not actually, but it's the last email you feedback know, we have for the I website. Actually, stuff. Yeah. I actually have a topic for today, but go ahead and do your email feedback. Oh, well, yeah, okay, all right, okay, yeah. all right. Look at you. Right. I have to confess, I didn't put it in the doc because mm -hmm. for some reason I thought today was supposed to be a mumble show. Oh, we can do that. We should do that soon. Yes, I, I must have been confused, but go ahead. Well, all right. So uh, here is the last thing I just want to touch on with the website stuff because it's awesome and uh, it's, it's sort of uh, motivated us to make some changes. So it came in from Sibo Jar, and it's a big one. He says, hey, guys, I just listened to Coda Radio, and it was nice to hear you talking about the uh, Jupyter Broadcasting 2015 project in terms of app developers and creating an app ecosystem around Jupyter Broadcasting. I currently develop the Roku app, so I think it's a good place and time to throw my thoughts out. I'm glad you're embracing your app developers. I hope this means there's going to be more community building among us. He mentions that there, there is a pound Jupyter dev IRC channel on GeekShed, but it's kind of dead, and the dev site is down right now. He goes on to say that he'd like a new API because right now I make the most out of the RSS feeds. Uh, JSON API would be great, but in the case of the Roku, XML is my only option. I also would like certain types of feeds data to be available uh, to offer better experiences too. For example, a feed for each show with all the different types of downloads, which I think we have just internally. Uh, so people have better choices on screen. Others want uh, feeds with full show notes, which I never thought about on the Roku. Uh, what would be great for an Android app, he says too. Uh, so he says, I feel like sometimes I'm, uh, I'm sitting on the outside looking in. I'm really, hope I'm really hoping that this is going to make a change and that the future of the JB developer community. 
He really wants to pull together and have some nice apps for the wider audience. So what we decided to do is, because we've got a lot of people, a lot of responses to redesigning the website and then sort of building some services off of the JB site, is I think starting... So why don't we do this? Starting next week after Coda Radio, we're going to do a mumble meeting with anybody that wants to help participate in sort of this, has ideas or things they want to talk about or questions or things that they need for their apps. So if you're a developer and you can participate after next week's Coda Radio, join us on the Mumble server, which you can get the address just by doing bang mumble in our chat room. So this will be on the 15th. And then we'll record that and make it available to the Patreons on patreon.com slash today. And we'll also make it available to the folks in the Jupiter Dev IRC. So even if you aren't able to attend the Mumble, you can hear what people are talking about, what some of our ideas are for the site next year, and get an idea of some services we need to build around it, and we can kind of collaborate. It's all just kind of research and talking about it right now, and we'll probably get serious about it starting next year. So that'll be after Coda Radio. So we, we should just do a Mumble show next week, and I'll just stay on Mumble after the show. Makes a lot of sense. All right, so we'll do a, we'll do a call-in edition of Coda Radio on the 15th, which, uh, yeah... Call in edition on the 15th, and then afterwards we'll do the developer JB 2015 summit. Which, if it goes well, we probably want to start doing those on a semi-reoccurring basis. The holidays are here, so we can't quite do it weekly, but as development picks up and we get serious, we might want to hold those weekly. So that could be a thing that becomes more reoccurring. We'll have more info about that soon. And thank you to Simo Jar for sending that in. Uh, okay, Mike. Well, so we have uh, like a couple of things. Just a couple of last notes I just want to get to really quick, um, and then we can uh, we can get to the topic. Mike wrote in, not you, different Mike. <gasps> and he just I wanted to mention that uh, his team is working on something called EveryBit. It's a startup company in Toronto. Recently, they've released a new website capable of end-to-end -end encryption with pure JavaScript using your own open-source JS library. He's looking for comments and feedback from our community, so I have links in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. So it's... Uh, it's supposed to make it really easy for developers to plug in end-to-end -end encryption. And it's at i.cx for the website. i.cx. And uh, we have the About page linked in the show notes. Okay, Mike, why don't I thank Linux Academy, and then we'll get into uh, the, uh, to the topic of the day. So everybody, go over to linuxacademy.com slash coders right now. Just check it out. That's a way, that's, first of all, go there because you're going to get a great deal. And I think once you sign up, you'll realize this is something I'm going to stick with. It's something that I've been really impressed with since I've signed up. They've been adding so much content. Uh, they just officially launched their new Puppet Professional Certification Prep Course. That course will take you from zero puppet knowledge to certification ready. Puppet is a game changer. If you've got more than a few servers, remotely, locally, all over the web, doesn't matter. They've launched two new courses, one on Docker and one on Vagrant. That's a great content. And in the past 30 days, they've launched over 100 videos and 100 practice exam questions so you can quiz yourself. That's why that continued membership really pays off. So go to linuxacademy.com slash coder so you get a discount. Go check them out. They've got step-by-step -step video courses, downloadable comprehensive study guides, and courses come with their own server. They spin them up on demand. Seven plus available Linux distributions for you to choose from. And they have all kinds of great content. Introduction to Android development, introduction to VMware, CentOS, Git, and GitLab from start to finish. If You, you know what? Go take that one. If you're going to go roll out your own GitLab server, take that course. And so you get the time estimates there. Like some of them are seven hours. Some of them are one hour. Well, this one's one hour, 44 minutes. The GitLab one, three hours, 20 minutes. And that actually gets broken out even more so once you take the course. It's really cool. Plus, they have the scenario-based labs. So you go through and actually deploy like a Bind9 server and put it in production. So that way you've actually done that before. It's a great way to boost your confidence if you're going into a new job or just check up on your skills like I like to do. linuxacademy.com slash coders. And a big thank you to Linux Academy. linuxacademy.com slash coders. All right, Mr. Dominic. I had a few things I was going to tease you with, you know, just sort of rib you with, but I'm curious to hear what you'd like to talk about. Yeah, so uh, Chris, have you heard about Core OS? I have, yeah. I talked to the uh, co-founder of it yesterday. Good man, and what did he tell you? Uh, they have launched something called Rocket. Yes. Yeah. That's that's what he told me. <laughs> what do you want to know? Well, I mean, since we were really, you know, covering oh, the yeah. Docker thing quite yeah. a lot, don't yeah. you think this is something we should go over or no? Yeah, oh, good, good point, good point. Yeah, yeah it yeah. is It is particularly interesting. So 
You know, I, I to back up uh, when when uh, when we first started talking about Docker, it was pretty basic. It was really a container, right? right? It, it, it was some interesting. Uh, well, I mean, if you remember, Chris, we started talking about it. It wasn't even like 1.0. It was, yeah. Oh it was, way. Oh yeah. Way early. Yeah. I know. I know. But so see, since then, I still respect Docker a lot. But since then, it has really developed into a massive enterprise grade commercial piece of software with it's the Docker platform. Hub and the Docker yeah. orchestration and the, yeah, the Docker platform and the yeah. Docker API and Docker Enterprise for behind the firewall Docker Hub f- functionality. And I mean, it's massively huge. It's way, 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 way bigger than what Docker was when it kind of got started and in some ways that's awesome and exactly what corporate america needs and in some ways it's way overkill interesting so if you really think about it right i mean that's that's really cool to have all that stuff but some people they just want a straightforward container that has an open spec that's really interesting i'm actually super excited about um the new tools in docker even though it's it's definitely a lot heavier. Yeah. And one might even argue it's not really what it was supposed to be, right? Right, right. But it does have some amazing potential. That's why I think it's kind of interesting. I guess when I was watching Docker, I'm like, oh, this is cool. I like what they're doing, but I also kind of am worried that they're kind of getting away from the core requirement of what Docker is supposed to be solving. And I feel like what Rocket has done is Rocket's come along and said, all right, well, we're just going to stay kind of focused on this aspect, the really important right. stuff. And... Uh, you know, uh, Brandon Phillips, the co-founder who I talked to yesterday, is also like on the board of Docker Advisors. So he could probably work with them to adopt the uh, open spec that the rock, the container spec that I think I'm getting the terminology wrong. It's like yes. app container spec that so the rocket has created. That's what I wanted to talk about. Do you feel as more of an open source guy that this is not good, right? That there is some sort of risk of creating a weird fragmented situation? Because as someone who, you know, does work to implement these kind of things or could potentially do this kind of work. To me, Docker getting the necessary features for the enterprise is actually a great boon, right? Because mm. now it's something you could actually sell to the enterprise rather than you know, use yeah, internally. I don't or- uh, I don't I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think uh, I I don't think it's I don't think there's gonna be a big problem where if you're all in on Docker then all of a sudden you meet somebody that's using Rocket, you're screwed. I think it's gonna be pretty painless. But I'm not sure. So, who, who, in your opinion, is upstream to who, right, if that makes any sense? Yeah, I don't know. I guess, I think Rocket is its own, it's its own thing. Right, I feel like they're separate. I feel like they're, yeah, they're very similar right now, right. but they, I don't know, to, to but me. But see, they, the, but the, at the end of the day, they're all just sitting on top of Linux kernel features on top of a Linux file system, right? I mean, it's not like it's, it's not, it's right. not even as dramatic as, uh, VirtualBox versus VMware versus Zen versus KVM. It's not even as dramatic as that, right? It's it's something in between. So I, I don't think it's. I think in this in the sense that uh, if anything, this will keep Docker focused on also still providing that core need. So in a way, I think it's going to keep Docker uh, inspired, and I you know the core OS guys have said that they're going to continue to support Docker as a first class container platform, on core OS. So I. I don't think this particular one is like a big division of labor or uh, anything like that because there already was multiple container solutions available for Linux. Docker was the best known. I mean, Docker is like one of the the best known things in tech right now, really. Docker is hot, hot, hot. They went from obscure open source project to huge. Yeah, Microsoft is, you know, working to make Docker work in the next version of Windows Server and Red Hat is creating big, huge partnerships with Docker and, and pushing them to release 1.0 so they could include it in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And, you know, uh, Mark Shuttleworth is, you know, says that it's, it's a huge area of focus for them in Ubuntu for the cloud and solicited people's ideas to how to better make Docker work on Ubuntu and put a stat right. out there like Ubuntu is used six times more than any other distribution for as a Docker uh, host and stuff like that. So Docker is huge. But I think it has gotten a little uh, off, off the vision. It's it's interesting. I think it you know it started as a very focused uh, make make the technology around this Linux container capability easier. Uh, you know, make it fun- more functional for developers, and then money came in, <laughs> and it's well. I, yeah. I I mean, it became a, it's become something entirely. They now use words that I'm barely familiar with, like really like. And when you read their website, the jargon on there is really strong with Docker now. Now that's fine, but well, because Docker is not. I mean, 
not to make core OS's argument for them, but Docker's not selling to the developers anymore, right? They're selling to the CTO, the CIO. I, I don't know. You know, I've, I've been following, read a lot of articles about core OS, a lot of the kind of back and forth here. I mean, I definitely think like, okay, the Docker hub, I'm looking on Docker's website now, they have this Docker hub for enterprise yeah, they're pushing. Yeah. Like, certainly they've gone a little big E enterprise, right? But I don't know, it's still a great technology, and it seems like just jumping ship is kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like, I. And it's, maybe it's unfair because I haven't actually used CoreOS. I, I pretty much stuck with Docker when I've had a need for this. Yeah. Well, at the time it was interesting too, like right during one of Docker's big uh, conferences, right before a big conference, right before the conference started, they made that, the CoreOS guys made the announcement. And then, then there was DockerCon or something like that the next yeah. couple of days. Uh, so, uh, but, you know, also there is some fundamental security issues in Docker that they are not addressing. Right. And that's where Rocket's kind of stepping in. I, I would suspect that after a year or so, it'll be almost transparent to developers. Well, see, to me, it looks like Rocket should somehow get, get like, consumed into Docker, right? Like, There's Rocket. aspects of it could. I think, the, see, the thing is, is there's just, there's different fundamental business goals here. See, now Docker's got the Docker Hub with the Docker Enterprise, right. where uh, Rocket is a little different. You could maybe run your own hub. Yeah, uh, you know your the distribution mes- method for the files can be FTP, HTTP, SSH, BitTorrent. You know, there's like a lot more build and plug and build your own solution around Rocket. So I could see uh, large data centers just rolling their own Rocket implementation behind the firewall, and then I could see you know uh, large enterprises developing applications through Docker Hub. So for the workload. Rocket to me seems more like an infrastructure. You know, this is where we're gonna. This is this is how we're gonna do uh, thirty-five nginx servers on this on this one really powerful box. And it and and then you know, as a developer, you'll just know it's an it's an environment it's an environment with PHP and nginx or I don't know whatever. But you won't really care very much beyond that. Now, if you're doing the implementation, then you'll care. But I don't. I don't. To me, it seems. It almost seems like a necessary like way to sort of keep Docker relevant in that area too. Like if nothing else, right. having Rocket sort of nip at Docker's heels a little bit and say, hey, you know these these issues you have here? Well, now we're going to call you out on it and we're going to maybe show you a way you could fix it even. It is really interesting though. Like I'm reading the Docker website. The tone, like... Yeah, the Docker changed. response, yeah. So I'm just reading, what is Docker? Docker is an open platform for developer instances and means to build, ship, and run distributed applications. I we'd have to use the Wayback Machine here, but I don't recall ever worrying about sysadmins before. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, it it's kind of w- it's funny that whale is sort of it's representative of what Docker has become. It's a whale of a platform. It's a good it's a good whale. Right? No, it's good. I I like Docker a lot. I'm just it's just if this is what like the day I heard about Docker, if this is what their site was, if this is what their pitch was, probably never would have used it because it would have just read to me as way too expensive. Yeah, like crazy expensive yeah this to me feels like some enterprise guys got in there or gals right this feels like if i wanted to talk to somebody about docker i'd have to call them and they'd give me a quote yeah yeah and you'd have to have a meeting with the sales guy and they'd have to bring the sales engineer so that way you could actually ask some technical questions uh yeah i don't know what to say about this it's I think I'm gonna cont- I'm gonna watch to see where the see the yeah. thing is. Are these CoreOS guys, if 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 there's somebody to do it, it seems to be them. Uh, this so is, the fear would be if Docker, area. right? Docker goes like full enterprise somehow, and I don't know if they can because of the licensing and everything. But, can they already have? <clears throat> well, I mean, to to the point where it just wasn't useful without paying a significant amount of money, right? I I think for a little while though, Docker was being looked at as a way to distribute software even for Linux, right? Like, this is going to be... Yeah, not going to happen. I mean, I'm, I'm right. looking at this. You, you, that's a crack dream. Like, that's right. just not going to happen. But maybe with Rocket. I mean, it's just... The, the, the big problem I have with their new site, and this is me getting all, putting my beret on and being a designer, their old site used to tell me Docker is a container platform. Oh, yeah. that makes sense. This is what a container is. Yeah. Now they're using terms like a platform and 
platform can mean anything. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Like, like this is definitely not targeted to me. This is targeted to CIO, CTO. Which, I mean, more power to them. It's great. If an open source product is making a ton of money, that's awesome. Like, it's not a criticism. Yeah, I agree. I mean, it's it is just, good. You know, I guess there's, it, it's almost like, you know, if Ubuntu had done well with Ubuntu phone, right? If Canonical had done well. You would be happy for them, but also you'd feel a little left behind, right? I suppose so, yes. Right. Now, it wasn't uh, um, Crazy Spaceman on your show two weeks ago? Yes, he was. Uh, how was he? Very nice. Um, he uh, he still very much believes in the convergence, and uh, they're working on it. Yeah, I was listening to the episode, and then all I heard in my head was ground control. <laughs> oh, jeez. It was weird. You know, I think, just to put a cap on the container discussion, I think what we're going to see is there's just going to be a lot of ways to do containers on Linux, and there's just going to be some more prominent ways, and there's going to be some really, like, basic ways that right. might just be, like, built into the system. System D. As it so, do you know, does CoreOS have support from, like, EC2? Can you just straight up spin up an EC2 instance with CoreOS right now? You know, I don't I don't know about EC2, but you can on DO. You can just send a DigitalOcean. You can do it that way. I, and I think on Rackspace. Oh, really? Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, Rackspace is all in on CoreOS. I talked to them at OSCON, and they were really excited about it. Uh, I have, a, I have like, a weird, like, sort of uh, uh, end-of-show topic for you. What's that? I it's like I know you're an Xcode fan, right? Object oriented object oriented programming that's just the way of the future, right? It's the only way forward. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, your buddy Les, he wrote in. I think okay. he's he's like he's on your he's on your wavelength. He says, "Hey, Chris and Mike, a few weeks ago you were just discussing the quality of user interface designers available and how so many fall short. Well, I thought you'd appreciate this video I found." And he links us at about four minutes in. You get to see an old interf- interface designer in action, which seems to be very, very simple and maybe even better than what we have now. It's also nice to see a glimpse of Xcode's history. He says, I enjoyed the guy on the sunbox making a mess when building the user interface with those old black and white screens. So it still works really well for audio listeners, so I'm going to play a little bit of this. But if you have the video stream up, this is really a treat. But I, I have it linked in the show notes, too. So if you get to listen, I'm just going to play like a couple minutes of it. And Mike, I don't know if you have the stream up, but uh, I, I've got it up. I'll just mute over here. Yeah, you, all right. You watch this, and it's it's classic. It's it's really great. Every application on a Next computer is built using Interface Builder. Interface Builder is not just a simple user interface prototyper. It is an application builder. <laughs> oh my I've God! Created the basic framework <laughs> for the application, and now I'm going to to lay out the the contact information window. Over here we have. What, what we call a palette, and all that is is a collection of different objects which you can just drop into your application. In this case, I'm dropping in what we call a matrix of fields. You have to give each of these, of course, the appropriate name. The next thing we have to do is we have to create the three buttons we need for the contact information panel. Now so to do this? that, we can just move over to the mm-hmm. palette and drag a button over. Do, 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 do. I also don't like the spacing of these buttons, so I'll stretch them out just a little bit. There you oh, go. Before relative layouts, it was a good time. I think this is something I could do. I think I could get into this. I feel like this is my speed. I feel like I did this this morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Isn't that great? Oh, my God. And then I look is... at that, too, and I think... Where well, what has really changed? So I can tell you exactly what changed, because now you have to care about multiple screen sizes and bullshit like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's impossible. Like, listen, relative layouts are are the death of design. I and I'm sure we'll get hate mail, but but Mike, material solves everything. Material it has a liquid fluid, you should, you, you youthful design. Yeah, but with of magical you, what? Oh, with magical ponies and. Uh, uh, and oh my god, and Twilight Sparkles is gonna come bake you a cake. I it's, know it's, it's so buzz heavy, it makes my mind numb. Well, it's not even material, it's like you know why iOS apps always look nicer other than more design dollars, etc. Higher frame rate? Have, what? No, when you have a static screen size or oh, maybe yeah. even two, yeah, fucking hard code those coordinates, baby. You get everything <laughs> down pixel perfect. Woohoo! And I, now, with oh, I, I'm I am the anti relative layout guy because it. I mean, we do them all the time, but it just, 
it's very limiting, right? Because if you have to care about what this looks like. Mike, I have two words for you. Responsive design. Sorry, Michael, I can't unlock your iPhone for you. That's what I have to say to that. <laughs> what is that? Holy <laughs> crap. Siri woke up and was like, no. Wow. I'm not unlocking your phone. Just stroke it a little bit. That'll fix it. Wow. Yeah, I do agree with you, though. Yeah. It is. every For every step forward, we take a step back. All well, right. Ob obviously, you need it, right? But just, just think of how beautiful it is to be able to be like, you know where I want this button? Right here. Man, we have such a good blog post from MailChimp, but I'm I'm beginning to lose my voice. I don't know if I can read it, but it's so why good. Why don't we save it for next week? Cause I haven't read it yet. So okay, I'm sure, I'm, yeah. And I'm sure I, I saw it in the doc, so I'm sure you're being a uh, D-bag, but I'll, I'll have something yeah, for you next week, have, too. That's fine. Okay, it's that's fine. good. So, I'll, you know what? This will be a good one for the mumble room because we're going to have the open mumble room. Yep. So that would be a good one to save. And then I can go cough up a lung uh, off mic. Don't die. I know. I'm already like looking into like crazy ass remedies so that way I can try to heal myself as fast as possible. <laughs> I've got one job, and it's to talk. Mike, where should we send folks throughout the week to find you? Send them to fingertip.technology. Fingertip.technology. Don't forget, next week, call an episode on Mumble and then stick around afterwards for our developer conference for the, for the JB2015 site redesign. We kick off at Monday, noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern over at jblive.tv. Go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar. Go to radio.reddit.com to contribute to the show. jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact for your feedback because we leave it. We love it. We need it. Send it in. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in this week's episode of Coda Radio. See you right back here next week. Mm -hmm.